Hey, welcome to the very first tutorial video of TCG Engine. So this is going to be the onboarding tutorial video and I'm going to show you all the basics and how to use this engine. So the very first thing you'll want to do after importing the package is to make sure that uh, in the package manager you have all the right things. So these are the package that I have in my project. You really need to have netcode for game objects installed as well as shader graph and uh, universal render pipeline. If you create a 2D empty project, you should already have 2D sprite in Unity UI in your package. And the other one, uh, like post-processing to chain Linux and Visual Studio optional, but I would really uh, recommend them. To chain Windows Linux is necessary if you want to be able to build a dedicated server later. So let's dive into it. Um, after you imported the project, you should already be able to play in solo. So if I just click play and then uh, choose a deck here, let's go with the fire starter, play solo. And there you go, the game should work. If you have any issues in the documentation, I have some uh, common installation errors. So maybe you can check there first or you can just uh, ask people on Discord. All right, so now you'll probably want to start adding your own cards abilities. So I'm going to show you where all the most important files are. If you go in your project folders under TCG engine and then uh, resources, you can see everything there from uh, abilities, cards, card back avatars, and then packs. So all the data for your game is in here and also in the top resources folder you will see you have uh, some more generic settings. So if you click on gameplay data, you can change here um, how much HP the player start with, same for mana, and then uh, you can also change uh, how many cards should be in each deck, what's the duplicate limit for a card, and uh, tons of other useful settings. And then in network data, you will see if you want to play in multiplayer, which server do you connect to and which port do you use to connect to it. Also, uh, right now we are in test mode because the, we didn't install the API yet. So you should leave this to test for now until you go and install the web API, which will enable a lot of additional features such as login with user password and then leaderboards, friend list, and other things like that. But for now, as long as we are in test mode, all the user data will be saved locally on your computer at the Unity persistent data path. So one thing that is interesting here, if you go in gameplay data, at the end, you have test. These are the test deck that will be used when you launch the game directly from the game scene. So if I open the game scene, and start playing. You will see uh, I have a mix of cards of all different colors here. It's because I'm using the test deck. So if you go in resources deck and click on it, um, let's say you want to test a specific card. I can just click on one here. Then I can change the card I want to test. Let's say I want to test the shark. Then I can just put a lot of that card in, in the deck and then click play. So this is very useful if you want to quickly be able to test a specific card without having to go through the menu and change it in the deck. Okay, so let's revert that. Just doing a control Z. Now, if you go through the resources folder, you will also see that you have cards here. So you can see if I click on any card, you can change the mana, attack, HP. So all the stats for the card, you can change the rarity you can change its type. So there's four different card type included in the TCG engine demo. Characters are card on the boards that can attack. Spells, they are effects that are resolved immediately and then sent to the discard. Artifacts are also on the board like characters, but they are not able to attack. And then secret, they will go in your secret zone right here and they will be triggered during the open and turn. So you can also change the art. If you want to create a new card, all you need to do is uh, you can start with a card that is similar to the one you want to make. 
let's say I want to make a fire card and I can just click on this one and I do control D it will duplicate it I can just create my new card let's say it's called warrior the name of the file uh, is not relevant you can name it the way you want but me I usually like to name it the same than the ID so it's easy to find the ID of the card this is what is used to save the card in your save file but also on the API later when you install the web API so uh, it's something that you should not change too often because whenever you change it it could break the reference in the save file or in the API so once your game is live it's probably a good idea to just keep the same name here then you have different traits here that you can change so these are not uh, don't have any specific intrinsic effects they're just kind of keywords that you can assign to each card and reference later when you're creating abilities so one example would be the wolf there's a ability in the game that gives plus one attack to all wolves so that's how you you would do that by adding a, a trait here then you have the list of abilities i'll explain a bit later how to edit and create your own abilities with data files and also i'll also show you how you can create new effects in the in the scripts and then you have uh, lots of different like effects that will appear um, during the game that you can change here so one thing to note is that if you go in resource asset data you also have similar effects here but these are more the generic one that will appear on all cards if they are not assigned on a specific card so if you want uh, spawn fx that is the same for all cards you can just put it here and if you don't assign it on the card if I go here and I just let, let's take my warrior and then if I just click here and remove it then it will use the default one instead of using a, a specific one just for this card and then you have the deck building checkbox here this is whether you want the card to appear in the deck building or not if you remove it it will not appear so usually this is done for cards that are just summon in game so here i have a folder summon all these cards don't have the deck building because they are just spawned during the game through abilities and then finally here in the packs you can set uh, where you can get this card when opening a new pack so this card can appear in uh, any of the two packs that are currently in the game so if you're creating new cards, uh, what you could do is also create a new pack just for specific to your game and then only add the new cards there so that you can test the pack opening feature that works with just your cards. So this is it for cards. Um, if you look at avatars, card backs, these are quite straightforward. So I won't go through it, but basically you can just assign usually a picture to each then you have effects and conditions these are specific to abilities i will explain them when i go uh, in abilities later decks these are the decks that you can use in game so these three they are used as starter decks you can choose them any player can choose them right now uh, when they go in the main menu and the test decks this is the one that you play when you start the scene directly you can change all that if you go in gameplay data here so you have all your starter decks, free decks, as well as the test deck when you launch the scene directly. Then you can edit your rarities here and the icon. So I have a kind of gem of different color here for each rarity. Teams, same things. You can assign a team to each card, which is kind of like a faction. Here in the resources, you also have status effects. So normally in, in the game abilities, they are just assigned to a card and they stay on that card but the advantage of status effects is that it can be added or removed to a card so if you need an effect that is not permanent it's more something that will last a certain number of turn or that would be added by another card then it's probably best to use a status effects here and then abilities are a bit more complex here but I think it's really worth to take the time to understand how this works because that's how you'll be able to create new abilities and or edit the one that exists and make your game more unique. So that, as I shown earlier, each card has abilities that are assigned to them. So you can edit and create new one here. 
So let's take one as example. If I click on play summon wolf, this is the ability that will create wolf when you play the alpha wolf. Another thing that you should note is that there's a description on both the ability and on the card. So if you look here, this is the ability. I have a title and a description, but I also have one if I go in cards here at the bottom of the card. It also has a text, a description, and then a title. So this is really up to you. If you want to put your text on the abilities or on the card directly, they will both be displayed with the card. So I'll show you in game how it looks like. So if I go in the collection and click right click on one of the cards, um, this is the card text here and this is the abilities text. So sometimes if you're changing the card text, this one, and you wonder why this one is not changing, it's because this one is on the ability data. So here you have the trigger, this represents when the ability will be triggered. So you have a lot of different choice on play when the card is played at the start or at the end of the turn, when the card attack or defend, when the card dies. You also have a trigger when another card is played or when another card dies. And then you have activate, which is used for activated abilities. This means abilities that the player manually need to click on to use it. And those abilities usually have a cost. If you go down here under activated abilities, you can add a mana cost or exhaust, which means it will use that card's turn action. And finally, you have ongoing. Ongoing are abilities that are always in effect, but there's just a limited number of effects that will work with ongoing because these are more, they're not like abilities that stays permanently on the card. They're just abilities that will be active as long as the card is in play. So if we take this one as example, uh, this card also has, I'll show you the card. You go in forest wolf here. So this one has two abilities. One is that it summons two wolves next to it. And then it also has an aura that gives plus one uh, to all other wolves. So this is an ongoing ability. This means that as long as this card is in place, all your other wolf will have plus one attack. But when this card dies, then that plus one will be removed. So that's why it's ongoing. And ongoing only work with a limited set of effects usually it's just to add the status or increase or reduce stats they will not work with more complex effects then you have conditions trigger here you can add additional condition so here you have a good example this one gives plus three attack during the opponent turn it will not be triggered if it's not your turn that's why there's this condition here then you have the target there are different targets that you can choose from here in the list. Usually there are three main different kind of targets. So you can target either cards, players, or the board slots here. Board slot targets are usually more for summons and things like that. So self, this is the card that has the ability. This is the caster. Then you can also target yourself as a player or the opponent player. Then you have all players, all cards on the board, all cards in all piles that means it includes the deck the discard the hand and also the board and the secret area but all these targets can be refined with a condition so later i'll show you how you can target only one of the player's deck or one of the players discard all slots same thing you can also refine it with condition if i go back to the to the wolf this one says all slot but it has a condition that says the slot must be empty, so there's no card on it. It must be ally, so it's on your side, not on the opponent's side. And then it must be next to the caster. So if you read the effect, you'll understand a bit better why these three conditions are there. So on play, summon a 1-1 one, one baby wolf on each adjacent empty slot. So adjacent would be this condition, and then empty is this one. So if I continue here, the list of targets, you also have play target. This is used mostly for spells that require you to drag the card directly on top of another card. So
So um, if I go in game, let's see if I can find one. Yeah, I have the wave here. So this is a good example. The wave, I need to play it directly on a target. So this is what the play target mean. Then you have ability triggerer. This is mostly for either secrets or when attacking. So you have here on before attack, on after attack. If you want to target the card that you are attacking or the, ca the card that is attacking you, or in the case of a secret, the card that triggered the secret, then you should use uh, this, this target here. And then the next three target, these are really like a UI that will appear for the player to select something. So this one will ask you to click on a card that is in play already. So just click directly on a card to select it. This one will open a menu where you can select a card in this menu and then click OK. This is usually for abilities that you can go and retrieve a card from your discard. And then choice selector lets you select between two or three other abilities. So if you have a card that tells you either you do this or you do that, then you will have a choice between multiple abilities you can use that. And then finally, uh, the game also saves like what's the last card that has been played, so what is the last card that has been targeted by one of these, or what's the last card that has been killed, so you can use those as target as well. So one good thing to think of this is whenever you want to target more than one card, if it's not a selection, then you probably will want to click on one of these here, so target everything, but with a condition telling that it's not actually everything, it's just a specific set of cards. If I go and click here, so this one also target all cards in all piles, but actually there's a condition that says it must be in your hand, it must be ally, so it's not in the opponent hand, it's only in your hand, and it must be a blue card. This one is probably not necessary because it it's already just targeting cards here. Could probably remove that one. And this ability reduces the cost of all the cards in your hand. So it has the effect add cost, then minus one. So we are talking about the mana cost here. Then you have filters, which work a bit like condition, but they have a bit more flexibilities in the sense that they will take an array and then filter it and return another array. But I think this will be more clear when I show you how to create the script for condition and filters. But if you go in the example here, you can filter only the lowest attack or a random card. So if I would do filter random one to this ability that we're looking at right now, instead of summoning two wolves, so one on each side, it will choose a random slot on the one that are valid in the condition. So it will only consider these two. Let's say the card you play it here will only consider this one and this one, but will would take only one at random between these two. And then you have your effect. These are all the effects that have been pre-coded in the demo, but you can code your own. I'll show you later how to do that when we get into the scripts. Value. So for this ability, I don't think the value does anything, but sometimes you have abilities that uh, you can add a value. If it says add attack, add HP, then they, this will mean how much attack and how much HP the card will get. And then some effects that will appear when you cast the ability. If you want the effects to appear on the caster, on the target, or in the middle of the board. Same thing for audio. Here you have chain abilities. This was added to be able to create more complex abilities. So this means if you add an ability here in the list, the, this first ability that you're in successfully triggered, then this one will automatically be triggered right after this one finishes. I think I have a good example of that with the, with the killer whale. So if I click on this card here, it has an ability that says on play destroy a character with four or less attack. If you do, draw a card. So this is the chain ability part here, if you do draw a card. So this one has the target, select target here. 
This means that uh, when you play this card and the ability triggers on play, it will ask the player to select a target. It can only select a target that matches those conditions. And if you manage to select a valid target, then it will trigger the chain ability, which is drawing a card. So there's times when you could play this card, but there's no target that are valid. There's no enemy that has four or less attack that is a character and that is not itself. So usually when what will happen is that you will have to cancel the ability and not play it at all. Then you will not draw a card. So now maybe let's look at how the secret works. Secrets also have trigger like other cards. But uh, it's important to use one of the triggers that work well with secrets. So one that can happen during your opponent's turn. These are usually after an attack or uh, after another card has been played. And as you can see, the target is usually the ability trigger. So in th this example here, this card transforms the next creature that is played into a fish. So the trigger is on play other because it's another card that's been placed. It's not that card itself. And then ability trigger, this means the card that triggered the ability. So the card that has been played, it will be transformed here. So before I go into example of adding a new card and new abilities, I want to show you also, um, other than the resources, what are the main prefabs that you can edit? So if you go in the prefab folder, here you have your managers that you should include in the game scene. And you have also the network manager. Uh, this one should be included in all game scene, but also in the menu so it can start connecting with the server. And then the game UI, this is all the UI in the game scene. So let's say you want to move around where is your player avatar where is the name and all that, you can just come in the game UI and move things around or change the art. If there's a panel that you want to edit, um, let's say the choice selector, you will see that right now it's not visible. So you have to click on the canvas group here, alpha, and set it to one. If you do that, you can show and hide different panels in the UI. So same thing for the card selector and uh, everything else. Then if I go in prefabs gameplay, if you want to change how the cards look on the board, that would be in board card. You can open this one and then uh, you could move the attack. Um, I don't know, maybe you want the attack and the HP to be at the top instead of the bottom. Or you want the team icon to be in the corner. You can move those things as you wish. Also, if your card changed to another shape, then it's probably best to, to change it to another art here that represent more the shape that all cards will have. Same thing for the cards in your hand. So this is the version of the card that appear in your hand. This one tries to put more emphasis on the cost because that's the important part when it's in your hand. And then you have a card UI here, which is used in uh, different places in the game, like the cards in your collection or the card that appear as a preview when you over. So this is the one that you will want to edit for all the cards that are shown in the UI. Okay, so I've shown you the main prefabs that you can edit here. What about the scripts? Going to go into the scripts folder. So at one point you probably want to go into the code to change the game rules to make it unique and specific to your game. One good place to start with that would be all the scripts in the game logic here. So uh, here, this one is what execute all the actions in the game, like playing a card, attacking a card, drawing cards, uh, what happens at the beginning and the end of a turn, what is the win condition. So this is all in game logic. You also have game.cs here. This represents the current game state on the board. This is the class that is sent between the server and the client to refresh the state of the game. So if I go in game.cs, you will see it contains basically all the information that represent the game state. 
what is the current player, what is the current turn. Then you have all the players that are here. So if you go into the script player.cs, you will have more information on each player and then some temporary data that is used for abilities here. When it says non-serialized, it means it's not uh, important to be sent to the client. So this one stays only on the server. So if I go in player, then you have all the main information here. You have HP, mana, how many cards have been killed. Then you have a list of cards in your deck, cards in your hand, cards on the board, cards in your discard, and then cards in the secret area. You also have the stats and status that are currently affecting your player. Same thing if I go in card, then you will have like how much attack HP this card has, if it's exhausted or not, how many damage it has received, and then all the current status affecting the card. And then ongoing bonus, this is for ongoing abilities. Because the way that ongoing abilities work is that every time there's a state change, it will refresh the ongoing abilities and clear this value and then recalculate all the ongoing abilities that are currently in play. So that it makes sure that this bonus doesn't stay when the card that has the ongoing abilities is removed. Then let's go into game logic. This one is really the game rules, what happens during an action. So let's go with play card. Yeah, here. So here I have the action play card. This is what happens when a player plays a card. So first it will validate that the action is possible. Then it will pay the amount of mana that the card cost. It will remove the cards from all arrays and then reset its stats. Then if it's a card that goes on the board, like a character or artifact, it will be added to the cardboard array. Then the slot will be set, attack, HP, all the stats. If it's a secret, then it will go in the secret area instead. And if it's a spell, then it will go directly into the discard. It will be saved to the action history, which is the square that you have here that shows what has been done this turn. And then abilities will be triggered and the ongoing abilities will be refreshed. So same thing for a move card. If you want to change the logic, it's all here. When you cast and activated abilities, it's here. Attacking a target, it's here. And then if you go in game.cs, you have some condition that can be checked by both the client and the server to know if an action is possible. So you have can play card, can move card, and then can attack target. So I know a lot of people want to change this logic here. So I think these are kind of useful function to change the rules. Some people wanted to have cards that can only be played on specific slot or that can only be played at specific moments. That would be where you change this logic. Basically, just return true or false based on if the card is allowed to be played on this slot. Same thing for attack, you return true or false if the card is currently able to attack the target. So you have different kind of target. This is when the card attack the player. This is when the card want to attack another card. So one important thing is that everything that is in the game logic server, uh, you should never add anything related to visual here because this is supposed to be just game logic, pure game logic. This is what will happen on the server side. It's also what the AI uses to predict moves. So you should never have anything that relates to visual because if you put visuals on the server, they will just not work. And if the AI has to manage all the visual, it will become very slow as well. So what you want to do instead, if you want to change anything that is more visuals to the card, then you don't go in the game logic folder, you go in game client. And then here you have all the visual representation of each object. So you have board card, board deck, which is these here. You have the board slots, which are the empty slot on the board. All of these, you can change a representation. So if I go in board card, the only thing that this does is take the state of the game here. So first it gets the last refresh. If when you get game data, it will give you the current state of the game. And then from there, you can access pretty much everything. You can access the player, the card, so if I go here in this function, you can see this card here. Uh, it will display the cost, the attack, the HP, and then the, the other different stats, as well as the image. So I go there. 
yeah, I would assign the image sprite title, all that. So let's continue with scripts. If you go in game server, these are the main managers on the server side. So this one is like the top level script for the server. This will handle receiving connections, player connecting, and then all the actions are sent to this. And this one will redirect the action to the appropriate game because your game server can contain more than one game at a time. So it has a list of games here. And then the game server scripts, this one represents just one game. So this one is for only one game. It will contain the state of the game. And then it has the game logic to, to execute all the action it's received. So you, as you can see here, all the comments that the client can send. So when you receive a play card action, it will execute this, which is basically first validating that this client that is connecting is an actual player and not just an observer. And then it will run the action with the, this player. If I go here, it just get the card that is, has been sent and then it will run a gameplay. This is a game logic script. It will execute the action. Server manager local, this is to play when you play in solo. This one is already included in the scene, so it's not in a separate scene. This one, server manager, this will be in your server scene, but uh, in the game scene, if I go here, you will see server manager local. So this one kind of simulate the server um, when you're playing solo. It doesn't start any external process or anything like that. It's, it's really just running directly in this scene. And then server matchmaker. This is also in the server scene with the server manager. It just handles all the matchmaking logic. And then you have all the effects for abilities here that I've coded already. I'll show you how to create your own. Same for condition, you can also create your own by just creating a new condition script. So this is a really cool system, I think, to be able to create new abilities that are not already coded into the engine. API, this is all the script that manage connecting to the Node.js API, which is where all the user data and card collection are saved when you're in uh, API mode. But right now we're in test mode, so this is not really used. Then you have the AI, you have two different kind of AI. You have the random AI, which just basically plays randomly. If you want to test a specific card, uh, you can always just go into resource game data and change it to a random. So it would be much easier to test something. Then you have all the data. This is basically the script that defines the scriptable object that you have in resources. And then FX, this is just really just handling different kind of visual things that appears on the board. Menu, this is all your script for the main menu. And then UI, also just for the visual side of things. Okay, so now that you're quite familiar with the basics and you're able to add cards, abilities, things like that, probably you want to be able to play in multiplayer at some point, not just in solo. So I'm going to show you how to set up this. If you just downloaded the asset and you haven't changed any settings here, you'll see that this URL here, it's connecting to my own server. If you haven't added any special abilities or any new cards, you should be able to connect to it. When you see finding opponent, that means you're connected to the server. Otherwise it will show connecting to server. So you can always try on my server, but as long as you add a new card or add a new abilities or change any stat, then uh, it will be out of sync of the server. So you'll probably want to set up your own instead. What you can do to test in multiplayer is that you can make a build uh, in local for your server and also for your client. And then test locally before you uh, host it on a cloud server. And if you ever want to host your server uh, online, uh, then I'll, I'll make another video to explain how to do that. So if you go in your scenes, uh, in the server folder, uh, you will see there's a scene called server. This is the scene that you'll want to build uh, if you want to make a dedicated server. So what we're going to do is remove all those scenes and then add the server 
and we're going to click on server build here and on newest unity version instead you will have a dedicated server here on the platform instead of having this checkbox so you should select it when you want to host uh, in the cloud you probably want to target linux because that's usually what i use for my cloud server but since we're testing locally we're just going to use the windows platform for now so i'm going to save to my server windows make a build okay so my server build is ready now we're going to do a client build but before you do that you should go in resources network data and then change the url here because uh, this is not your local server so when you're testing in local you should put uh, 127.0.0.1 this uh, usually means that you're connecting to the same pc so now i'm going to make a client build i can remove this scene delete and make sure to check all of these so login and also game and remove the server build here Okay, so now that all my builds are completed, I'm going to start the server. Since we checked the server build box or dedicated server mode, then it will appear uh, directly in the console without having any graphics. Then I'm going to run my client twice and try to connect to it. So one thing that you want to be careful about when you're trying to test in multiplayer is uh, check out the user here. As you can see, I'm connected with the same user twice. The game won't let you play against yourself. So even if you try to find an opponent, you will just find no one because you're with the same user. So what I need to do instead is I need to log out and then I will use a different user. Now this should work because I have two different accounts. I'll try and now it's working already this is the first player and now I can play um, if you go into your server you should see that the clients are trying to connect and uh, that the game was connected was created so this is how you test in local with a dedicated server there's also an option in the engine to test in peer-to-peer. -peer. I've created a scene here called test peer-to-peer. -peer. I, I will not recommend to use that for your final game. I think the dedicated server is much better for this type of game. But peer-to-peer -peer can be really useful if you just want to quickly test without having to build a dedicated server. Because this one you can just build a client and you'll be fine. So if you want to test in peer-to-peer, -peer, you need to add this scene as the first scene and also make sure that your game scene is included. Just going to build this. Okay, the build is complete, so let's try that. I will run it twice again. I don't need to run any server because this is a peer-to-peer -peer test. And since we are in test mode, I don't need a password. I can just connect with two different users. Login. I'll choose a different deck for each one. Then I will host with this one and then join with this one on the local IP. There you go. Now you can test uh, without having to build a dedicated server. So this concludes this video and I really hope that it was helpful.